Well, hey there, friend, and welcome back for another episode of the Your Hair Mentor podcast, where I'm your host and your hair mentor, Crystal Green. And I invite you to come take a listen to the top leaders and thinkers and experts and innovators in the beauty industry as they share their stories of triumph and struggles and success in creating their businesses behind the chair. I hope you enjoy these episodes just as much as I did recording them. See you on the inside, friend. Awesome. Okay, well, Haley, why don't you just give me a quick intro of who you are um, now in your business and what you're doing, and then I kind of want to like have you take me on a journey of how you got there. So right now, <laughs> I call myself an educator and a coach, uh, and my focus is mental health for hairdressers. I only work with hair. Well, I say I only work with hairdressers. It's slightly expanding into the beauty industry, but it's same problems, you yes. know, and same things. And so it's expanding a little bit. Um, but my background is hairdressing, but I'll come to that in a minute. Um, I'm a coach and educator all around mental health for hairdressers. And so I I do one-to-one -one coaching. I teach uh, classes in salons. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm currently working on a, a mental health global program with L'Oreal called Head Up. Oh yeah. I saw you post yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. And so I just, by the time this podcast comes out, it could be more <laughs> everywhere, but it's, it's, um, yeah, L'Oreal are doing something around mental health that asked me to be a part of it. And I'm thrilled about that. And I'm, I'm excited that mental health is going to become more talked about that's something that hairdressers need. And I think someone like L'Oreal behind that gives it a little bit more oomph, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and so essentially, yeah, but for my side of things, I sit on my computer all day coaching people or I'm in salons uh, doing workshops that I've written and stuff like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. So I want to know a little bit more about Head Up in a minute. We'll come back to that. Uh, but will you tell me, so you were a hairdresser. Yes. Uh, how long were you a hairdresser? Let's start there. How long were you a hairdresser? <laughs> how many? 30. 30. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah, I don't look old enough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I mean, at this point I've been in the career for 22 years myself and it's just like, I don't understand how that happened. We started when we were four. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah. so you were behind the chair for 30 years. What did you do in the in the 30 years that you worked behind the chair? Tell me about that career and what shaped you. Oh, it's, it's I'll tell you how it started, really, because that's kind of funny. Uh, I, I never wanted to be a hairdresser. It wasn't my burning desire. I was at college. Um, I was doing media studies mm. and stuff like that. And I was, at the time, having these really mad extensions also like not not beautiful extensions like now okay. these were more um oh I don't even know you would call dreads and multicolored and synthetic they were designed to look crazy not beautiful yes. natural extensions as we see more now so they were crazy and I was having those sorts of things done uh, and I really fancied my hairdresser and I thought and and he was saying oh we're opening a salon and we want an assistant and I said I'll do it just because I wanted to work with him. And my gay dad was not very good in those days. <laughs> and my hairdresser turned out to be gay. And so that didn't pan out very well. But hairdressing panned out well. I liked it anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I stayed. And so uh, I wasn't very happy at college. And that's why I was a bit like, oh, I'll do that. This seems cool. These people seem fun. Mm. Uh, and so that's how I actually ended up hairdressing. Um, you know, a lot of people, I think, have this burning passion. And I just didn't have that. I fell into it for silly reasons. But I stayed because I liked the people and I liked that you got to be yourself. I liked I didn't have to wear a uniform. I liked I didn't work in an office. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was fun. The people were fun. And so that's how I started. Um, and pretty quickly, um, my college suggested that I move to a more, how would we put it? I'd put it as a posher salon. Okay. My college, I think that you would do well, Haley, in a city centre salon. And I said, all right. 
and I, I knew what they meant. You know, it was chaos where I was working with the hairdresser that I fancied. And so I ended up in a city centre salon that was, um, you know, a high end salon. And I liked it, though. And I, I started to see that this could be a good career. And I worked there for a couple of years as an assistant. And then Tony and Guy came to town. So we're talking mid 90s now. Tony and Guy opened uh, one of their first salons outside of London um, and I went to work for them and they retrained me. I work, I'm a, I was a colorist. I can't do a haircut. My blow drying is iffy at best, <laughs> um, but I do great color. And so I, I trained as a colorist and that's what I did for all of my career. And for a lot of my career, I described myself as like a triple booked colorist. That's how I worked. I had three clients on the go and an assistant and it was chaos. Yeah. <laughs> Creative yeah. chaos. And sometimes it was exhilarating. Sometimes it was completely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. um, but that's how I worked most of the time. Um, and so I worked with Tony and Guy for about 10 years. I worked my way up to the top. I was teaching for them in their academies and all of that. And I worked in different countries. Um, I worked in Belgium for a while at their Tony and Guy and I traveled around uh, and then I left and um, worked in an independent salon that my friend started and I worked there for 10 years. And in that time there, that's when I decided to train as a psychotherapist. And that's when the that's when the journey takes a, a detour. <laughs> yeah. So I want to hear like what made you leave Tony and Guy for one to then go into an independent situation and then how far into that independent situation did you decide that the psychotherapist needed to be the shift I left Tony and Guy because it just felt time you know in that I felt the world was changing I wanted to do things more my way um I'm really grateful to Tony and Guy though you know um I got great training I had good times and I got really good opportunities but I think it just was you get to a point where you wanted, well, I went, I got to a point where I wanted to do things for myself uh, and just in different ways. You know, I wanted to work in a slightly different way, do things and all that stuff that's not always so possible in somewhere, somewhere with such a strong brand. And my friend was setting up a salon. And so a few of us left together. Gotcha. Um, Sorry about that, Manchester Tonian guy. Right. Um, but if was left, sorry about that, yeah. Um, but we left in one go and set up. It wasn't my salon, but I was the colorist. Uh, and it was really fun. It was really fun doing it like that. And it was one, it is, it is still one of the coolest uh, and best hairdressers in Manchester. And it was one of the first really sort of trendy, if you trendy for want of a much better word, independence in Manchester. Okay. Before that, it was a lot of very old school, very posh salons and a few franchises. And so, you know, this was the beginning, I think, of the independent era starting. Mm -hmm. And so that will have been about 2005. Okay. Yeah. And that and was I, like 20 years into your career at that point. Is that about right? Yeah, I think so. I was, oh God, I can't do the maths. <laughs> I Me started, either. I started, to, I know some loose numbers. I started Tony and Guy in 95 and I'd been hairdressing two years at that point mm -hmm. in 93. And then I went into the, you know, my friend's salon in about 2004, five. Mm -hmm. And so it was a few years after, but I was about 20 years in <clears throat> when I decided to become a therapist. Yeah. I feel yeah. like that 20 year mark is kind of, I mean, honestly, it's a full career in any other field, right? 20 years yeah. is like one and done. And so I feel like when we're that deep into this career, it's natural for us to kind of crave some sort of like situational change or um, be inspired by something new. So I'm not surprised to hear yeah. that, you know? No, it's so interesting, really. And I think, you know, I, I think anyone who can stay anywhere for more than 10 years I mean, amazing, but I, it's not for me that so much. So I think I moved away from Tony and Guy into independent because I crave change. Uh, and then I'm not sure I got the changes that I wanted. Right. And so I was looking around for other things. But I think a lot of people who come to me for coaching are around that age. The age I decided to become a psychotherapist is the age so many of my clients are, <clears throat> early 30s. Yep. Early 30s is an era where people are going, is this it? 
-hmm. is this going to be my life now? Oh, hell no. And people make big changes in those uh, in your early 30s. It's an era of striving as well, your 30s. It's where people are having kids, getting houses, doing the things, growing, you know, and, and really moving forward. And so it's a big decade of change, your 30s. And so many of my clients are in that. And it always sort of makes me smile because I think I remember this. <laughs> yeah. I had a client tell me when I was young, um, I must have been 21, uh, doing this woman's hair for the first couple years I did hair and she was in her 60s at the time and a grandmother and she stayed with me for years uh, but she told me she's like Crystal ju I just can't wait to see what you're like in your 30s and I remember thinking what are you talking about and she was like women in their 30s are in this just beautiful time of their lives where they're like you know doing more learning more I don't know she just painted this like picture where I was kind of like I don't know what you're talking about crazy lady I'll do your hair for you but then when I got to that age it was like oh I get it I see yeah. it yeah mm -hmm. it's a real time of I feel it can, you can look back with a little bit of perspective and you can think to yourself, is this it? Yes. It, it, am I happy with, I remember thinking to myself, I don't think I can do this for the next 30 years. And so I better do something. And I thought to myself, I'm probably at the peak of my earning power as a hairdresser. And so if I don't fund the change now, I won't do it. And I'd spoken to people who were older than me who'd said, do it because it won't get easier the longer you wait, you know, to make a big change. Yeah. And so the reason I chose psychotherapy, uh, I didn't fancy my therapist. That wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, that would have been weirder. Um, <laughs> no, I, I was having some therapy because I was struggling with my mental health. Um, I've struggled with depression on and off since I was a teenager. And it, things were not great around my early 30s for, for loads of reasons, you know, um, and some of them were I wasn't happy in my job anymore. Um, I was struggling with the culture um, of hairdressing as we were doing it mm -hmm. at, that, at the salon. Um, and also my coping strategies were rubbish. I didn't really have any good ones. And the ones that I'd been leaning on for years weren't working anymore, like partying. Mm -hmm. they didn't work anymore they made it worse uh, and so there was lots of things going on and so I'd be, I by the time I decided to become a therapist I'd been in therapy for two years uh, and was feeling much better in lots of ways but my love for hairdressing was didn't come back mm. and I thought I need to do something else and I'd gotten really interested in psychology and psychotherapy beyond myself you know like I'd yeah. sort of thought this is good this is interesting. I could sit down and do this. This looks good. And so I just said to my therapist one day, I want to do what you do. And she said, oh, yeah, I think you'd be good. Ah. <laughs> and told me how you how to train and where you went. And um, I figured out that I could do it while still behind the chair because it took four years part time. I was going to ask what that looked like for you, what that process was. Yeah, it was it was two days a month for four years. And you had to be in full-time therapy yourself for the duration of the training. Wow. Which was what most of the money was in a way. Yeah. Uh, and that's how that looks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. So then yeah. did you end up with like, um, is it a certificate or like a degree or yeah. what is it? It's different than America, um, how psychotherapy works over there. I trained in um, a private place. And so, you know, um, there's different levels of getting accredited. And okay. so, you know, I, I became a therapist. I got my certificates. I'm a transactional analysis therapist. Well, I was, I'm not anymore um, because I don't keep up all the things legally in the background that you need to, because I don't work as a therapist anymore. And then there's different um, exams that you can do after that. Gotcha. Um, to get fancier. Yeah. Okay. So then you got your certificate as a, um, psychotherapist. Is that mm -hmm. you said? Yes. Psychotherapist. Yeah. And then when did you leave working behind the, the chair? Day. The next day. Are you serious? I You're don't like, know. I'm out of here. I'm, that literally is what happened. Really. I was like, I'm out of here. Um, um, but what, actually what happened was I got 
sort of offered a job. I got offered an I got offered an interview that was pretty much going to go quite well to be um, a school counsellor, if you like, a school counsellor. Uh huh. Sixteen to nineteen year olds. And a friend of mine already had the job and she was leaving and they said, do you know anyone? And she said, yeah. And she put me forward and she, and, I, and she said, I think you'd be great. And it gave me the confidence to leave my job because I got three days work from them. And it was just about enough to pay the bills. Gotcha. And so, you know, and so what I did was I made that, I left the salon. I did three days in the school as a school counselor and I loved it. Uh, and I did a, I still did a bit of hair mobile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A little bit just to sort of top it up. And then eventually I got my own private practice as well. And so I still stayed at the school and I rented a space as a therapist and I took on private clients in that way. And then around that time I stopped doing hair altogether. Yeah. you like I probably did a couple of friends still, <laughs> yeah with a bottle of wine and hanging out yeah definitely a bit of that in my kitchen and stuff but I really sort of stopped all together around that time and I did that for about five years mm -hmm. yeah full time as a therapist and I absolutely loved it and I loved working with the teenagers I've got such passion for teenagers they're so funny yeah it's such exciting time I love I that's just such a they're just ready to go and they're so frustrated <laughs> And so angry and so funny and I love it. Uh, and so I loved working with them and it was brilliant. But I actually found working as a therapist quite lonely. Um, it's just you and one person in a room over and over. And I found and I live on my own and I did then and it was you come home to quiet and it felt too much. And I started to notice after about five years that uh, I thought this is affecting my mental health again. I'm feeling I can see myself getting low. I'm lonely. I felt lonely. Mm. Uh, and so I thought but I was smart enough to know what to do about it and I had more information and I thought I'm lonely because my job is too quiet it, there's not enough people I need some banter and some fun and around this time a friend of mine messaged me and said Hayley we're desperate for a colorist please do us do us anything you can and I said I'll do you a day I was like I'll do you a big favor and I'll do you a day and help you out a little bit and they were like done <clears throat> and so I started working one day in a hairdresser's um, and it shocks me to death that I loved it. Really? Yeah, because I just thought, oh, I'm doing this as a big favor. Like, you know, I'll do you a solid. Um, but actually, I really enjoyed it. And so slowly over the next, I think it was probably about eight, after six months of doing a day, they needed a full time colorist and they were going to hire. And I needed to decide, is it going to be me or not? And so I jumped and I said, all right. I left the school. I kept my private practice. I left the school and I did, I was like four days in the salon with a private practice in the evening, a couple of nights, still therapy for a little while. But eventually I just stopped and I went back into full-time hairdressing. And it was such a shock to me that I enjoyed it again because I really wasn't enjoying it when I left. Yeah. There was so many things that I was frustrated with uh, and, and, um, like sad about you know it was stressed I was stressed I was very stressed that's the way to put it yeah and and I realized around this time I well I reflected on why am I not miserable anymore and I realized it was the therapy training I'd learned some stuff and it was really serving me well as a hairdresser and I thought to myself I should tell other hairdressers about this <laughs> you just gave and, me goosebumps <laughs> Yeah, it, mm -hmm. it, I just thought to myself, I've got something here and I want to help people who felt like me, who felt there was no option but to leave because it will never change. And that's how I felt when I left. And I coach people, I coach hairdressers every day who say, I'm going to have to quit because it won't change. It can't. It has to be this way. And I coach people all the time like that. And, and I, I understand it so well. And so I wrote courses that would have kept me in hairdressing. That's what I decided. I, I I wrote them for me at the time when I was unhappy. Um, and so I started out by, I wrote my first course that I still run. It's still my favorite. It's called Manage Your Mood. And it's a three hour course that I do live in salons and I do it all the time still. 
I've never changed it since I first wrote it because it's good. <laughs> uh, and that's the course that started it all. Wow. And I got, yeah, and I got that. I started teaching that. This is going to make you laugh um, towards the end of 2019. Ah, yes. <laughs> so we see how that live went. And so I, I, I start, I launched the Resilient Hairdresser to the world in 2000, uh, November 2019. That's when I hit Instagram. That's when I decided to be official and I felt ready. But I'd been teaching in salons for a few months leading up to that. And then, yeah, 2019, I was like, I am ready to educate and help busy hairdressers. <laughs> And then, oh, <laughs> oh, okay. And, you know, but I was still behind the chair at that time. I wasn't in the salon anymore where I went working for my friend. By this time, I actually had a home salon. Um, and this room that I'm talking to you from now was a salon. And that's what I was doing. I, You know, I needed another change. I wanted to just do things my way. And if we'd have had studio suites, I would have had one. But we that's not a thing over here, really. It's just starting. Phoenix just opened in Manchester ah. but um, it was not a thing and there, so there wasn't really many options and so I got a home salon uh, and so the pandemic hit so I stopped doing my clients and my education business stops and I thought oh okay yeah <laughs> as we all did you know and all of right. that and you know I think we're all really bored of that to some degree and even talking and thinking about it but what was interesting was I got this opportunity to really focus on the education business because it was the only thing I could focus on. Yes. And so I just sat on Instagram every day, paying attention to what hairdressers were saying they were stressed about mm -hmm. because it wasn't what I'd planned to help them with. Oh, really? I, because I thought they'd be overbooked, but oh, what right. they, were, they had no clients and no money and no income and they were terrified and all sorts of things were happening. And so I really, you know, I remember in that time you couldn't batch post because I was literally reading the room on a daily basis. And I just thought, you know, and luckily um, there's a lot of stuff to back up what I know about mental health. And so I could roll with what was happening and I just paid attention to what people were talking about and I tried to help. Mm -hmm. And that's, what I did and so I really built my business in that time I, I think it probably built quicker than it might have done because I had the time and everyone was staring at their phone not only that too but I feel like for the first time in a lot of people's lives they had an opportunity to stop and reflect and it was I think yeah. a, kind of a great awakening in our industry of people that were like oh I didn't realize that I was like this close to a mental breakdown <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, loads of things happened. And I think the first in the UK, the first six weeks was sort of chaos because we didn't know if we were going back to work next week, the week after. When will it be? Surely it'll be soon. Uh, and then eventually the government said, no, this will not be for at least three months. And we were like, oh. And so I had a time, everyone had a timeline to work with. It was actually longer than that, you know, in spits and starts. And where I live, um, we were locked down worse than most of the country for longer. We had less freedom for longer. Mm. Um, it's dense, it's dense where I live, uh, a dense population. And so it was um, for longer. But I think people did exactly what you're saying. They reflected once they had a bit of a, some security and how long will this be the grants started coming out from the government and things started you know when people could stop being really worried for their lives in a way because you know it's I mean we kind of laugh a little bit now but I remember how scary it was at the beginning uh, and Completely. I remember just my you know our income disappeared overnight and and it's scary um and all of that and I think once people had a loose plan then they started to reflect I agree. I think this is actually quite, I'm quite enjoying sitting in my garden in my deck chair in the sun. This is not too bad. Why don't I do more of this in my life? Oh, is this what time off's like? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people started reconnecting with old hobbies and things because there was not a lot to do, you know. And But what, what I also noticed was I remember speaking to a group of hairdressers and they were in America and I'm not even sure how I was talking to them, but I was someone asked me to come and talk to them 
And what I realised was this group of people were struggling with their mental health because they were very work-focused people. And when it was taken away, they didn't know what to do with themselves. And they were starting to realise that they got all their validation from work. And so they didn't know how to feel good without working. And that was a really big realization for these people. You know, when I, I sort of pointed out that I thought that might be what was going on, they were like, oh, it absolutely is. And so there was all sorts of things going on. And so it was crazy, but a really exciting time for my business because I had to think on my feet a lot, but I think it gave me a lot of confidence that I had solutions for a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. an interesting perspective to be able to share with people too, because I'm going to guess what happened is once the pandemic was over and everyone went back to work, we went from this like relaxed, comfortable state, right? Of like, oh, maybe this isn't too bad to jump right back into the hustle because all of our clients are like biting their nails, waiting to get in with us. And so it was like work, 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 work. And then having that feeling, I know I felt this of like instant, um, just like super stressed because you're trying to jam everyone in, work extra hours, do all this stuff. And you're like, whoa, what am I doing? Because it was like a quick onset stress, I feel like it was more recognizable in a way and it didn't feel as normal. Oh, and and something really interesting happened around this time, actually. And so what you've got to remember is I was still behind the chair at this point. And so I experienced, and and I'm actually grateful in hindsight that I experienced it because I think this experience changed hairdressing and it changed hairdressers. And so I'm I'm grateful that I I didn't quit until, um, I, I basically, by the end of the last lockdown in the UK, we had three, I didn't come back. I said, yeah. I'm done. And that was because my back was a problem, not because I was done. I, I, I was having real physical problems around this time with my back and I, I sort of had to quit because I couldn't stand up barely anymore. <laughs> kind <laughs> of a, a big whole... deal for hairdressing. It was kind of a big deal. Um, yeah, and so that was that really. But what ha- what I really noticed was, um, you know, going back after the first lockdown was exciting and weird. Yes. And, and 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 then chaos and stressful. But by the t- and then we got locked down again, everyone had a break. And then when it came to the next one, all the hairdressers started freaking out because they knew what they were going back to and they all got the fear and they got anxious and more stressed. And and I wrote a course at that time to solve that. And it was called Burnout on Boundaries. And I still run it now, but it's different. But it was, I basically wrote a course that was how to cope with going back after lockdown. That was what it was. And it really developed into something much bigger, that course now. But Mm -hmm. I wrote it because people were terrified the second time because they knew people are banging on the doors, on the windows, your phone doesn't stop. You've got all these guidelines. You've got to wear a visor and a mask. And it was stressful. And I feel like the first time when you didn't know what to expect, was easy but the second time when you did and by the third one in the UK when we were allowed out of lockdown and it was Christmas people were really fed up hairdressers Mm. were fed up they were stressed fed up stressed and fed up yeah yeah and I I can totally see that left around that time didn't they Mm mm-hmm and, and changed a lot of people left where they worked and set up on their own and people really made big life decisions all through that period but it was it's interesting to reflect on now and I wonder how that will pan out over the years. It's still reasonably fresh, isn't it, you know, for us. But I think I think the pandemic speeded up change in our industry that was going to happen anyway, but it made it faster. I would completely agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And like for the for the hairdressers standing behind the chair, for the hairdressers that wanted to be educators, for the hairdressers that wanted to retire, it was like everything had a real um acceleration. Yeah, let's just do it now. And I yeah. think, you know, so many educators were born in lockdown. And I think a lot of it was because people were bored and they needed something to do. Like I'd already started my business, but I suddenly had instead of a couple of hours a week to work on it, I had 24 seven. Yes. And and that was great in hindsight. And yeah. it was nice to have something that I could actually do. And so, you know, it saved my mental health in lots of ways because I just focused on that, gave me a project <laughs> right. for all that time that I was on my own. Mm-hmm. 
So Haley, without giving away any of your, um, your secrets, right. That are within your paid educational content. Can you give me any sort of little like nuggets that you share with people or kind of like overarching themes or anything that would kind of paint a picture of what you do in these courses? Yeah. And so I'll talk about burnout and boundaries a little bit, really. And I can give you the sort of overarching method in a way that I use. And so I think this, people often think that they can, if they work harder, they will get out of burnout. And that's the mistake that people make. I will just work like this for one more month and then it will be okay. I'll just, you know, it's always, I'll just do this and then it'll be fine. And those breaks never come. And so there does come a point where you have to do less than you're doing. They're just doors and it's very hard for people to accept. Especially when you have clients texting you and wanting to book with you all the time. It's hard to say no. Yeah, you're going to disappoint some people when you start taking care of yourself. And so these are the things to make peace with. It's, it's, you can't do it any other way, you know? And, And I say things like this to people a lot. If you've got more clients than spaces you will always be stressed. And so there are really some basic things. However, this is how I work. First of all, I think you've got to address your energy because if you've got no energy, you can't put boundaries in. You haven't got the brain space or the capacity. And a lot of people are in what I call a bit of a survival mode. They can't think beyond the day. And and this is what people realized when we all stopped in the pandemic was, like you said, I was this close. I didn't realize Um, but I think you have got to put, you've got to start by putting some responsibilities down and really addressing, making, looking, looking after yourself, however that looks for you as a priority. And so you've got to get your energy back and you've got to reduce some responsibilities. That's going to be the first step. And then when you start to feel a little bit better, then we're going to think what are you going to do with this business? How do you want to work? What are you going to do? What hours do you want to do? What boundaries do you need? What support have you got? Who can you be leaning on? What do you need? What are you unhappy about? What may, all of that. And then we're going to start developing those boundaries. And then people are going to go, oh, this feels awful. And then we're going to support you through that phase. And then it's more maintenance. And people come back. People sometimes have coaching with me quite intensely for a while. And then they just, and then they come back two years later and go, I let it go. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know what happened. And we pull it back, you know, and sometimes you just need to do that with somebody else. You needed that accountability, you know, and all of that stuff. But essentially for me, uh, you can't just go putting boundaries in one day. It's too hard. If you're exhausted, if you're burnt out, if you're feeling great, we just put some boundaries in. But most (laughs) that's not how it works. (laughs) Yeah. For most people, they're on their knees. And they've really been on their knees for a while. Mm-hmm. And then they maybe are getting physical problems. They're probably feeling guilty as a parent or a partner or a daughter or whatever. Um, they're prioritizing the wrong things and they feel really sad about that. And so you've for me, you've got to att- you've got to attend to the emotions that underpin all of this and the energy levels at the beginning. And I think that's what a lot of things miss that talk about this sort of thing uh, is that people miss the emotional side that it's really hard to say no to your favorite clients. It's really easy to say no to the ones you don't like that much. Um, But when you've got a, when you've got a clientele that you love, it's so hard. And, and people are confused often that they think all their clients are their friends. And, you know, I've learned some valuable lessons in life when I quit hairdressing and I thought oh, I'll be having lunch with these people and dinners no I, and I and I'm don't I don't think badly of them for it now it was a shocker to me initially but then I think of course not it's a sort of funny now but in the moment I kind of felt that I would see so many of them afterwards and I don't although saying all of this Three of my really good friends, and I mean really good friends, people I go on holiday with, I met doing their hair. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm so not surprised. Happened. Yeah. Yeah, of course it happens. But, you know, of the 80 clients I had when I quit, I'm only having lunch with those three. 
Yeah, it's kind of like any other job, right? Where you have coworkers that you see every day and you make like coworker relationships with them. And then if you leave the job, you think, oh, we're going to keep in touch. And like, you don't because it was the proximity, um, you know, that kept you close, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. like, I had clients that I liked and they liked me, but they haven't got time to allocate to lunch for me. They allocated talking to me when they had their hair done and now they're talking to someone else. And that's just how that goes. And I think, you know, and it's, I don't, it was not obvious to me when I was younger. I would agree. And it's not obvious to a lot of hairdressers that I talk to. Yeah, I agree. I feel like when I was young, I thought the same thing. And then uh, when I moved away from my first clientele and thought I would keep in contact with all these people and didn't, it was kind of like, wait a minute, what's going on? And I feel like I learned at some point to like compartmentalize the relationships in my life, right? And it was like, these are there for this reason and they, they serve me in this way. I serve them in that way and that's fine. And then I have like these relationships over here that serve me in a different way. And when yes. I realized that, it was like so much easier to digest. Yeah. And don't, rep- and you know, I think so often I've certainly been guilty of this in different periods of my life. I replace socializing with just talking to clients. Yes, I was. I was so knackered. I wasn't going out after work. I was tired. Mm -hmm. And so I was getting all my chat in the day. And so my my social needs felt met. But I'd let my friendships, I didn't let them go. But I was not investing. I was not investing. Yep. Uh, And then that starts to have an effect on your mental health. And so and I see it so often in the people that I coach, they're doing the same things that I did. I think it's I think there's universal things that hairdressers do. Not everyone, but, you know, a lot of us. There's common pitfalls. Mm -hmm. It's universal things that humans do, you know? I mean... Well, exactly that. Just under the lens of hairdressers, you know? This is how it looks for hairdressers. And so, yeah, so when I, you know... um, probably my most popular course really the burnout and boundaries it's 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 really developed since um the one I wrote in the pandemic and I'm working on making it even bigger at the moment actually and so next year it's probably going to change shape again uh, and become bigger and more in depth and um you know with more one-to-one coaching and whatnot in it and all of that but that's yeah that's what I spend my bread and my bread and butter is helping burnt out hairdressers like yeah. not leave <laughs> right right so yeah. that they can stay in a career that they love and then feel supported and have their cup filled yes and most i would say in general most of my one-to-one clients are either salon owners or freelancers they're self-employed mm-hmm. they're self-employed in the main occasionally employed people come but they're usually on their way out the door mm-hmm. they're on That's... their way to freelance An interesting perspective, actually, because you mentioned that salon suites are not really a thing where you are at yet. Uh, Something I've noticed in the States here, obviously, it's very wildly popular here. There are a lot of lonely hairdressers here, a lot. And I wonder, as that industry grows where you're at, if you're going to see more and more hairdressers that are kind of falling into feeling burnt out and lonely because they're not getting the like camaraderie that they want and filling their cup with their, you know, coworkers and they're just focusing on their clients. I wonder if there'll be even more of a need for what you're doing. I think so. I think what's interesting is, I mean, I have a membership for freelancers and so so they, they've got a community and they talk to me and they talk to each other and I teach them stuff and they support each other and all of that. But I, I, maybe this is just from my perspective. A lot of the freelancers that I work with and my friends who educate work with have got very good at finding communities. They do it through going on courses and making friends and even feeling part of a program. It makes you feel part of something, doesn't it? And so I think freelancers have gotten good at that but maybe it's just the ones I'm talking to. (laughs) I think there's still a great population of people that maybe it's the younger ones too. That's really the change that's happened here. Honestly, is people are graduating beauty school and going straight into owning a salon suite. And so they're starting their career just on their own. I think we're going to need to wait 20 years for England to hit this problem. um, Because we don't have, uh, we don't train in the same way that you do. Um, most people are at college and in a salon at the same time when they're training. You can't really, not many, you can, but not many people just do it full time. People usually go through a salon and then leave. And so freelancers, I mean, you know, a lot of them are a little, 
older when they start. That's going to change though. And I, I, it's interesting because I was talking to someone about this the other day and I said, we're going to have a situation soon where people are going freelance much younger because mm-hmm. they're doing it out of choice. Whereas I think a lot of people at the minute go freelance out of necessity. The inflexibility of the industry has forced them into freelance. Whereas I feel like that's going to, that's changing and it is going to become a choice. Yeah. A viable choice. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of been made to be this like um, elevated thing where like I'm on my own. I have my own suite. It's like uh, I'm cool because I'm on my own Mm -hmm. instead of I'm in a really cool, supportive group of hairstylists. I don't know. We'll see where it goes, but we'll see. I, like I say, I'm always paying attention to what's going on in America because often it's a little a few years ahead of us. But I was I've been talking about how you educate hairdressers will come here. It will become more of a thing where hairdressers go to like what you call beauty school for so many years and then you're done. Mm-hmm. And then what? Um and there'll be there's more need for education though, isn't there afterwards when that happens? and finding support and stuff like that but so I wonder but I I imagine you guys are at the front line of that because you you guys are going first well and we'll see generations yes young independent hairdressers instead of just fed up hairdressers who go independent it's different It's it's very different it is different. And um, those that I've worked with that are young and independent, one of the hardest things for them is meeting other hairdressers. Like they don't have the people skills and the communication skills. They grew up on their cell phones and yeah. they can make like small chatter with their clients, but they don't have any sort of like meaningful connections with other hairstylists in their communities. And they're like, oh, I've been working down the hall from this girl for three years and I've never said hi to her. And I'm like, why? Oh my goodness, go shake her hand and say hello. I'd be sat in there every time I had a break. Chatting. Same here. But yeah. I mean, I feel like you yeah. and I grew up a little differently. And so yeah. I, I feel like it's going to be a real struggle for them if they can't figure this out in the first five years of their career, you know? I mean, I think the hairdressing industry, it is always evolving, but I think two of the big changes have happened in the last few decades where social media and the rise of the freelancer These are two big, massive industry pivots Mm -hmm. that have had huge effects all across the industry. Yeah. They're changing the way brands behave. You know, the the rise of the freelancers changing how brands behave. Social media is changing how all of us behave. And so there's all sorts going on, isn't there? And I, I feel a bit like this sometimes. I feel like all the cards are up in the air and we don't know where they're gonna land yet. We're not sure. Uh, and I've got my eye on it. <laughs> I agree. I've got yeah. my eye on it from a mental health perspective. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Haley, tell me some more. So you have a membership you mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. Are these like post-course students or is it something that like anyone can join? Tell anyone me about that. Can join. Anyone can join. And so, yeah, I have a, a membership that you can literally just go and sign up. It's a small fee for the month. Um, you get there's a community of hairdressers that are truly supportive. Like I manage the culture, you know, it's not a free for all Facebook group. I manage the culture. I set expectations. I talk to people about how don't give help when it wasn't asked for and stuff like that, I, you know, so that you don't feel like there's a group of people wagging the finger at you. Uh, and so I really work on the culture in there. Um, and then I speak, I, I do a live lesson every month. It's just something. Um, around self-care new ideas ways to broaden your mind around your emotional self all sorts of things so anyone who's interested in self-development who's a hairdresser it's really nice for um and do that i have a leadership course i'm really passionate about leadership actually because i think one of the ways we're going to improve the mental health in the industry is to improve leadership and i think the thing is is that It's not the cultural norm that we get leadership training. Right. People are just thrown in the deep end. Oh, you're the busiest in the salon. You can be the manager now. Have even more to do. No, there's no training. Just figure it out. Uh, And that sort of thing is happening. And we get salons and we're thinking, oh, what about my mirrors? What about my wallpaper? What about my chairs? And 10 years in, you're like, what about leadership? 
these people are driving me mad. I don't know what to do. They're walking all over me and things like that, you know, or I can't keep staff and all sorts of different things. And so I decided a few years ago to write a leadership program because I, I think, you know, my experience as a hairdresser shapes all of it. And I think you've got to have been there and you've got to have experienced terrible leadership and excellent leadership <laughs> as a hairdresser, you know, and I feel like I've experienced all of that. And so I just, yeah, I set about and I wrote a leadership program and I love it. It's one of my favorite things to do. I love working with salon owners actually on creating culture and uh, working on their communication skills, their behavior and how what they do has a wider effect and how they can really, they can turn that round. Yeah, I mean, they really are what's going to keep the salons alive and not just the all the independent hairstylists. Like, that's not going anywhere. But salon culture, I feel like, is that yeah. kind of a pivotal moment right now. I'd be, I'd be sad if that changed, that that point tips, that salons weren't a thing and everyone was just independent. I'd be sad about that. Me too. You know, I had some really good times in the salon. Yeah. I had some stressful times, but my when I look back now, I just remember laughing in the staff room most of the time. I remember the nights out with my other stylists. I remember the great hairdos, and I remember being really excited when I was at Tony and Guy, and it was so cool. And you know, I I my memories are fond of being in salons. Same. So I'd be sad about that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I, I really, I'm just really interested in contributing to the hair industry in a positive way yeah and all areas you know I don't want to be seen as someone who's only bothered about freelancers or only bothered about salons I'm bothered about people that That's just happen that. to be hairdressers they just happen to be they're my people uh and so I wanted to help my people but I don't I want to help the industry uh, and, and so and sometimes though freelancers and salon owners need different help I can't do that in one place that needs separating out a little bit. I agree. Yeah. So yeah. I'm curious for you, um, as I, I think of educators as like outside of the salon industry, right? Like we, for example, I used to think of my fellow hairdressers as my comrades, right? They're the people I ping pong ideas off of and talk about formulations and all that stuff. And now that I've kind of stepped away from that and I'm into this like educator podcaster space, those are no longer my people that I can commiserate with, right? Yeah, because you've got different problems. Yes. And so for you, I would imagine it's the same. And I'm curious, have you been able to find like your people as an oh, educator? Have I? <laughs> yeah. Have I? I have got the best crew of women ever. Uh, one of them's been on your podcast, Maddie Cook. She She's so fantastic. Your she's just amazing she's one of my favorite people and and so slowly slowly Maddie was the last one to the crew to be honest I, I I'll tell you how it started and so my my crew early as an educator were Americans because I did a coaching course in 2020 in the pandemic with Elizabeth Fay. oh yeah and she was doing a, a program for educators and I was like I'll do that and I met a load of brilliant, and I'm still in contact with a good few of them, um, budding educators, and they were all American. And so my crew was very American, which was brilliant, but not that handy. Like I've still never met any of them in person, but we're working on it. Uh, and so, and then eventually I I messaged this head, this educator who was a social media coach. And I, I messaged her, I didn't know her, but I knew a few people had worked with her and I said, um, I sent her a message and said, can I buy an hour of your time? I've got some questions. And she said, yeah. And we arranged to um, talk on the phone. I don't, we didn't even do Zoom. I, I, <laughs> even, I even, it was so long ago, we didn't do Zoom. You know, it must have been early in the pandemic because I wasn't on, we didn't even occur to us to meet on Zoom. Okay. Yeah. And so she called Vivian Johns and she oh, runs yeah. the social club. Yeah. And so we got on the phone chatting and within 15 minutes of talking, she said to me, by the way, we're friends now and you're not paying for this. And I said, okay. And we were on the phone for three hours chatting oh. and that was it. We were friends. And then she introduced me to her friend, Emma Fowler, who's a wonderful color educator and hilarious. And we became a little gang and we talk every day on WhatsApp. So it's our WhatsApp chat is like 
talking at the coffee machine. We it's it's kind of constant drip drip all the time. Whoever's available is chatting, and when not, you go back and read what's happening. But we we really supported each other with our businesses. We were like, "What's a lead magnet? Well, how do you work Zoom? What's happening on Instagram? What you know?" It was literally like that's where we started. Yeah. Now we have bigger problems. Like, you know, we've all got memberships, and we're like. Right. What software do you need for a membership? How would you edit this? What about that? You know, it goes like that. And then eventually we were all separately having conversations with Maddie and we loved her. And we were like, should we bring her in? Mm -hmm. Should we see if she wants to come in? And Maddie was like, yes. And so the four of us became really tight. And I mean, I don't know how long ago it was that it became the four of us, but I've been talking to Viv since 2020, you know, and, and it's probably been about 18 months, two years that the four of us got the four of us got really solid. And I mean, I'm grateful every day for these women. I think about what my life would be like without them. And I think it'd be really lonely. Mm -hmm. I, I'd be flailing around in the dark sometimes, you know, you've yeah. got to find a crew. You've got to find a crew. Absolutely. I feel like I just kind of had this realization a few months ago myself where it was like a paradigm shift for me. And I was like, wait a minute, like all my hairdresser friends are looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about when I'm talking about lead magnets or ads. <laughs> oh, they're just like, I don't know. <laughs> and so I was like, shoot, I need to find people that understand the language that I'm dealing with these days, you know? And I think that I think what was really good about all of us is that they were they're all ahead of me to be fair they're all a little bit further down the road but when we met we were all very baby business I mean you know all of us are doing well now uh and in, in, in and and in different ways you know like I've started working with L'Oreal we didn't see that coming uh you know Emma's membership's one of the biggest in the UK Maddie I mean Maddie yeah <laughs> We'll just leave that there. <laughs> what does Maddie not know? She's amazing. She's a powerhouse. Viv, honestly, she's so good. She's working with brands as well. She's got all this education. She's now got a team of educators educating for around the country. Like we we laugh sometimes and we're like, do you remember when we didn't know what a lead magnet was? You know, and it's so exciting to see where we're all going. And I think what's excellent about us is we're not in competition with each other at all. We teach different things, but we have the same audience and we have the same issues. And I think when you're looking for that crew, it's really good to find people who are kind of at the same stage as you. Mm -hmm. Just like finding fellow hairdressers when you're doing hair. It's like everyone can support each other, you know, along yeah. the way. You don't have to be competition. You can be collaborative. Yeah. And each of us have like, I felt like everyone was a bit ahead of me tech wise, um, but not loads. And but then we kind of caught up, but they were like, do this, get this, get, you know, they were like, I don't know, six months in front of me with that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and we all have different skills that we can really help each other with. It's been brilliant. But I must shout out my friend, Misty Jane as well. Do you know Misty? Uh, just on Instagram, um, yeah, messaged a few Catholic times. Stylist. Yes. I met Misty on the Elizabeth Fay program. Okay. Uh, yeah, she was, you know, really one of the very first people that I met. And so she's still very much in my support network. We talk a lot and we talk about business and stuff like that and where we're doing. And yeah, it's great. So I have a really solid crew of uh, women that I'm thrilled about. Thanks That's for us. That's so great. I love hearing that. I have I feel like I'm just kind of scratching the surface, getting to know people. And I've met a few people that I'm like, mm, I like you. We need to hang out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yes all of that and you know it starts a bit professional uh -huh. and then someone says something a bit cheeky and you think you're for me uh -huh. and that's how it goes and it was funny like you know mist is a good example because we were on these coaching calls for weeks in the pandemic and i knew misty was for me because she just seemed a little bit naughty uh -huh. and a bit mischievous. you know and there's like a group of 12 people i kept thinking her i want to be friends with her uh you know and and it's just interesting i can see i'm on a course now uh and i know who the mischievous ones are and i'm like you're the ones i'm gonna take with me <laughs> exactly i find that and speaking in a group over. exactly anytime you speak in a group it. 
You, you make yeah. that eye contact and you're like, mm-hmm, I see you, you see me, we're good. Yeah, you know, and you can see that they laugh at your jokes and they're, you just think, and they make you laugh. And I think, oh yeah, you guys are for me. I can spot it quite quickly now. Same, yeah, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, do you have a crew? It's uh, just me and this one gal, honestly, that um, I feel like she has a podcast as well. And she's like a budding entrepreneur with education. And mostly in the podcasting space, we have a lot to talk about. And so she's been yeah. fantastic. Um, I am Kristen R- Ravoli is her name on social media. She's great. And I met a barber that I really like as well. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if he's quite as interested in, in having like the chit chat all the time uh, but he's great to bounce ideas off of and so yeah. I'd like to find some more like female energy to bring into the group that I feel like I could banter with a little bit more yeah and it's that sort of more consistent thing isn't it? it's like the day-to-day support and, yes. and, and it can be lonely working in your house mm-hmm. and just being like in this ridiculous whatsapp group is fun yeah but to be completely honest I really feel like I I love podcasting because I get to have these conversations with people I do feel like I'm making connections and I'm um, having things that resonate with someone else and I'm not just like sitting on my computer talking to myself or recording videos all day long so I I think it is a little bit yeah as long as you keep look at me coach as long as you keep your outside life going crystal don't forget. oh yeah mm-hmm. don't, don't worry your friends with podcasting chats yeah exactly because it's just like the client interactions it's right the same thing yep. <laughs> but it makes a difference and again like i coach people and so we're not chatting about netflix and handbags but <laughs> i'm having um fulfilling conversations with hairdressers and even when they're stressed, they're funny. Yes. A lot of the time. Yes. You know, we have a nice time, even though we're talking about tough stuff. We have a nice time, you know, it's not, yes. it's not as heavy as therapy, therapy can be. And so I don't feel like I'm just sat on my own talking to no one all day either. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I will say I have a great network of like mom friends that I have that sort of daily banter with, but again, they don't understand what <laughs> anything I'm doing and they're not even interested like honestly my friends I feel like my my friends mainly run museums and stuff that's what they all do right and they literally have no idea I'm not sure they could actually describe what I do Same. they're not they're not dead sure yeah they're not dead sure right they're like is she a hairdresser is she I don't know <laughs> yeah they're like she used to be a hairdresser I don't know she talks about stress I'm not sure <laughs> I don't think they'd really know what to call me in a way, it's almost better that way, like, because then you can kind of compartmentalize, like I was saying, yeah, you know what I mean? we're not talking about it. They ask me about my business and, you know, what you're doing. And I'm like, oh, this and this and this L'Oreal thing's exciting. And they're like, great. That's exciting. <laughs> Where should we go for dinner? Yeah. They're, like, they're interested to a point and that's nice. Yes. Me, Viv, Emma and Maddie are talking about the details. Yes. Well, I, on the other hand, I want to hear about the L'Oreal thing a little bit more, actually. So if, um, can you divulge information about that? Or is it like hush, hush right now? No, no, it's released in America. Oh, okay. Yes. I mean, who knows when this, whenever this podcast comes out, it's not quite fully released in the, it's a global effort. It's a global campaign. And so it's coming out around the world sort of slowly you know the big push and so some of it's available on youtube now but in america it's out and running and daniel mason jones is the other face of the campaign me and dan you know daniel i know the name yeah yeah he's lovely and i just absolutely loved working with him he's really fun and so me and him helped contribute to the education and we're the presenters of the education uh and so yeah, in America, you can access it, you know, get yourself on L'Oreal Access and it's all there. Uh, and there's live classes happening all around America now with the Head Up campaign. Uh, Daniel and a woman called Katrina who wrote it are doing them at the moment. And then in the UK, it's rolling out more in the autumn. And so I'll then start doing more of the live education over here and I think around Europe as well. And so it's really exciting and I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. And I'm Really, I'm. I was just when I first heard about it, which was very hush hush a while ago. Um, when they messaged me and said, "Well, you know, we had a meeting, and this is what we're doing. Do you want to be a part of it?" I was like, "Hell yes!" Right. And I just was so thrilled actually 
that a big brand were going, this matters. Because I just thought this will push it forward. Because I felt it was like me on my little corner of the internet. Yeah, like in this little fringe space. Yeah, over here. And, you know, but it wasn't, it's not widely talked about and accepted. It can feel like it is to me sometimes because everyone I talk to, but I know it's not. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I feel like L'Oreal making a global campaign is a huge leap forward for our industry. And it's really just focusing on the mental health of the hairdresser. Is that what the whole campaign is? Yeah. And that's why I evolved, you know, I mean, when I set out my business, I was like, I want to look after the mental health of hairdressers, because I think people always say things like, and they say this to me, oh, do you help hairdressers help their clients with stress? And I'm like, no, like the opposite. Yes. (laughs) Like the absolute opposite of that. Um, And so, you know, when they were talking to me about this campaign, I was like, I want to be really clear that this was for hairdressers. Because I think there's there's plenty of education about how hairdressers can help their clients even more. Yes. And no yes. one seemed to care how hairdressers were faring. Uh, and so I really wanted to attend to that. And I, I'm just, I love the fact that L'Oreal want to attend to that as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I bet you it's going to gain some serious speed. Yeah, it's like early days and it's creeping out around the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, it hits the UK in autumn. Because I checked the other day. I said, when's, the, when's when am I going to start seeing my face on Instagram adverts? I need to mentally prepare for that. And they were like, September. Um, and so that's exciting. But yeah, you know, if you're out in the States, you can access loads of it already. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to so, take a lot. It, yeah, it is a lot. It's very exciting. And I'm curious. It's free, it's free for everybody. No matter who you buy your colors from, it's available for you. Love and that, that. I love that again. I was most pleased about that. Yeah. So where do you see yourself taking your business in the next couple of years here, right? Like you're doing these in-person workshops and you have some online courses. Um, Is there anything else that you think you're going to kind of expand into or can you paint me a picture of where you, where you see yourself in a couple of years? Yeah, I, I really, I think I've been thinking about this a lot actually. And I've been thinking about how, um, I want to start working in a bigger way with companies and salons and franchises because I think my plan so far has been reach every hairdresser one at a time because that's just where I started and how I thought. And now I think I need to, I want to start thinking about ways to make bigger change and you've got to go to the top. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make more, I want to really approach, um, salons uh, salon groups about working on their culture and their mental health and stuff like that so I'm thinking about ways to do that at the minute I really like a bit of public speaking as well you know I love doing things like panels and stuff at conferences I'm doing one in October I'm excited I'm going to talk about salon culture apparently I was like I couldn't be happier Uh, because I think that's a really good way again to change the culture and stuff like that uh, and then me and Maddie are starting a podcast. Oh, you are? Yeah. So I'm going to ask nice. you all the tech questions. I'll be messaging you going, what do you do with this? Yeah. And so me and Maddie are starting a podcast. It's in planning stages. And hopefully we will, our first episodes will be out in October. Nice. Are you close enough geographically that you can be in the same studio recording together or it's all going to be um, di- digital, if I can speak digitally? Know, it's going to be digital. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We did, We live about um, maybe a two and a half, three hour drive away from each other. So it's not insane. Yeah. Uh, but it's practical. Gotcha. You know, yeah, yeah. And What's so the podcast th- going to be about? Well, it's going to be, it's all for the hair hair and beauty industry. And, you know, Maddie's all business and I'm all mental health. Mm-hmm. And so it's really going to be about supporting hairdressers in every way, apart from hair skills. You know, we're not, it, that's not our forte at all. And so we're going to have just, it's going to be mainly me and Maddie having conversations. We're going to have guests once in a while, but not really. And us really deep diving into topics um, that we're seeing come up as problems Maddie Maddie has a really big Facebook group uh, and people posting there asking for advice all the time and so we're going to solve these problems and we're going to talk about what we think 
<laughs> Perfect. We love talking about what we think. And so we'll basically pick a topic and deep dive it. Love it. Be around. It's all very much focused on supporting hairdressers. Yeah. yeah. That's exciting. And it'll be, you know, we'll have a laugh. <laughs> yeah. 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 The idea is it'll be, you know, you'll get something from it though all the time. And we want to really sort of um, encourage people to be like, have you thought about this though? You know, sort of if, if people show people what's possible. Mm-hmm. Because I think the reason I left the industry was I didn't know what was possible. Mm-hmm. I couldn't see it, so I couldn't be it. And so I think sometimes we just have to hear about things that are happening to go, oh, it's okay to do that, is it? I don't have to just quit and work in a supermarket because I, I can't be a hairdresser anymore. It's too hard. Right. Not that there's anything wrong with working in a supermarket, but I feel um, hairdressers sometimes leave and go to more unskilled work because they're too scared to make the changes. It feels too hard. Right. And I think when you can see more options, more of us will stay and have happier careers. Yeah, I think so too. And I think the majority of people that come into the career do it because they want that altruistic need of like making people feel good, right? Mm-hmm. And I think if they don't have the the tools and the know-how to help themselves make people feel good, then they're going to be disenchanted and want to leave, which is so well, sad. Be quite, yeah, it just gets overwhelming when you're very yeah. focused on looking after everybody else. You will eventually give more than you've got. And so you've really got to... There's a play, There's a time when everyone, people accept that that is going to have to be the case. And it's yeah. really tough for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, you have to put yourself first. Mm-hmm. It's tough for people to accept. They're like, mm, what about second? And I'm like, no, first. You can't look after anyone that's important to you if you don't look after yourself. Oh, is that not true? Do you have kids yourself? No. You don't? Okay. That was something I had to learn when I had my daughter. I have two children that are six and eight years old. And after my first one, it was like, I need to take care of this vessel. Yeah. Or this all falls to bits. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. It's like, you have to learn this because you have this thing you have to keep alive, you know? Yeah. I mean, that sounds, that sounds hard. That's why I'm not going to. But uh, (laughs) I was keeping those, but I just keep a couple of cats alive and I'm doing pretty well. They're 15. Um, (laughs) I feel proud of that. Yeah. Um, But I think as a parent, you can sort of be forced to learn that. But as a hairdresser, it's not quite as life or death. I was going to say do or die. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's not got that thing, but you must because no, you know, no hairdressing. It's the same. And I say this to people, you know, if you break your arm, it's over. The same, if you become extremely burnt out, it's over. You won't be able to serve your clients. You'll become inconsistent, unreliable. You have to take, you are your business. Mm, yes. I'm like, amen, sister. Yes. <laughs> it to the back and so yeah me and maddie are really focused on essentially i would sum it up like this self-development for hairdressers mm-hmm. beautiful yeah it's perfect yeah. chef's kiss oh <laughs> man well Haley, you are absolutely delightful this has been a yeah. real pleasure to talk to you and before we wrap this up i want you to tell my listeners where they can find you if they want to devour some of your content oh i'm an instagram baby I'm all about the Instagram. I didn't make it to TikTok yet. Uh, <laughs> thinking about it, <laughs> Viv wants me to do it. Um, the social media coach. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm a, I'm an Instagram person. I'm on Facebook a bit, you know, but my Instagram is really where I live, and it's where there's some good links to find all my stuff. And yes. So yeah, Instagram. And then for those that don't know, your Instagram handle is the Resilient Hairdresser. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then do you have links to like your um, coaching and yes. group stuff and everything on there? Hit the links and there's, you know, a link straight into my coaching. So Burn and Boundaries is running soon live. And so there's a link to that. And there's another link that says, click this one for even more. And then that'll may or less go to my website with everything on it, you know. Okay. And then do you have kind of a... Um... A customer journey that you like to walk people through? Is there something that you recommend they look at to first or is it just kind of a little choose your own adventure style? I kind of, I kind of have one in a way. I think 
most people usually come to me either for one-to-one coaching or burnout and boundaries. That's where they start. <clears throat> uh, and then they usually join the membership because they want to hang around for more, mm-hmm. but don't need one-to-ones. But then some people come into the membership because they're like, I'm going to start here with this small commitment. And then they come. So uh, I really think, yeah, people who come straight away really go into burnout and boundaries one-to-ones or the membership. Mm-hmm. And it's either's fine for me. I have some free stuff that you can access as well. There's a video called How to Avoid Burnout. I think it's called How to Avoid Burnout. It's a 10 minute video that gives you a little taster of me. Love it. Awesome. I'll make sure to put a little link in the show notes to that so we can kind of head people that direction for you. Thank you. Great. Well, I cannot wait to see what the next year or so brings for you. I feel like um, Me too. <laughs> I'm excited. Yes. Yes. I feel, you know, 2023, 24, it's looking good. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I'm well, thrilled. I'm thankful you're here. I know so many hairdressers are going to be thankful that you're doing what you're doing and you're going to keep them in their careers that they love. So thank you for yes. that. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we will be in touch. I'll be stalking you and Maddie to see when that um, podcast comes out. I'll be devouring that up. (laughs) (laughs) It's all happening now. It's all happening in the background. Love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Haley. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure. Anytime. Okay. We'll talk soon. All right, friend. Well, that's a wrap for this episode of the Your Hair Mentor podcast. It has been my pleasure to be here as your host. Again, my name is Crystal Green. And until next time, my friend, as I always love to say, have a wonderful hair day and I'll see you then. Okay, bye.